All right, what's happening, y'all? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores bringing y'all all of the important notes and quotes from day 19 of Washington football team training camp. Today, not a lot of notes from the specific practice. Most of what we're going to talk about today are some very interesting quotes coming from Ron Rivera himself, Jack Dorio finally, and Landon Collins on top of that, along with a lot of other things. Of course, we have to talk about a lot of the NFC East struggles that's going on and where we rank in an NFL analyst top divisions list. He ranked all eight divisions in the NFL. You can probably guess where we are. And then also this 5-2-4 defense that I've been talking about for the past couple of days and that I first noticed us really running in that Buccaneers game in the playoffs. There's some interesting quotes and stats about that as well. And y'all already know, man, we're going to go position by position, starting with the quarterbacks, then the offensive line, then end it off with the defensive backs. And of course, I got to give y'all the injury update before we dive into everything. But before we start, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell next to the subscription button so you get a notification immediately. And every time I release an informative and opinionated video just like this one, be on the lookout. I'm starting to work on some merch for this season. So be on the lookout for some more Street Scores merch. A lot of them are going to be really funny, trash talking, all kinds of stuff for the merch. Not just some simple WFT on the front. Like I'm already working on a Ryan Fitzpatrick or Taylor Heineke. And then it's the greater than symbol. Dak Prescott, greater than symbol. Jalen Hurts, greater than symbol. Daniel Jones. Just things like that. A whole bunch of really fun merch ideas that I'm already working on. So I'm excited. Be on the lookout for that. And of course, check out the rest of the channel. All of my videos are organized in playlists. I even have a comedy playlist for all of my funny videos. And like I've already told y'all, this is the last week of training camp news that us as the public will get. Reporters, everybody, the media, anything. After this week, everything is secretive. They're working on game planning against the Chargers. So those last couple of weeks before we play the Chargers will give me plenty of time to work on these rookie film sessions. So be on the lookout for that. I've already come out with the Jamin Davis and Deami Brown. Benjamin St. Juice and Jared Patterson and Samuel Cosme are definitely some of the next ones that are coming up. But without further ado, let's get it. All right, so first of all, information like this, I just feel like I always need to update y'all on it when it comes out. I'm not going to discuss it too much, just want to give you the information that's there. As of yesterday morning, the Washington football team had a 90% vaccination rate, tied for 23rd in the NFL with the Chargers, Ravens, and the Bengals. Amongst all NFL players, there is a 92.7% fully vaccinated rate or in the process. In all but four teams have a vax rate at or above 89%. And the NFL's threshold, the goal that they were trying to reach was 85%. So for the NFL, that's great news to hear. Again, I'm not going to talk about it too much, whether you are pro vaccinations or against it, whatever. Really don't care. I'm just giving y'all the facts. Now on to the injury updates. Curtis Samuel, Casey Tuhill, and William Jackson were on the side field working with a trainer in practice today. And Derek Forrest was on a stationary bike. And anybody that's on a stationary bike is usually concussion protocol I've been noticing this offseason. Every time they're like, oh, somebody was on the stationary bike this morning, we'll find out the next day or maybe just later on in the week that they're in concussion protocol. So don't be surprised if Derek Forrest is in concussion protocol or working his way back from it. But Rivera addressed the Curtis Samuel William Jackson situation. He said he's pretty optimistic about the whole thing and that he plans on both of them practicing sometime next week. So... It sucks, but once we finally don't get to get any information out of training camp, we don't know what's going on, what formations they're running, what plays they're trying out, what personnel groupings for them, all that type of stuff. Because again, they'll be game planning for the Chargers. So us as the general public, fans, media, whatever, will be getting like no information out. So by the time Curtis Samuel and William Jackson are ready to return to practice full speed, pads, 11 on 11s and all of that i mean i guess we'll know that they're back and fully healthy and curtis samuel has been a full participant in practices but beyond that we won't know what plays they're making how good they look and all of that type of stuff so man it sucks but i'll just be happy to have them healthy man also nikki javala pointed out that she didn't see sadiq charles at practice so I don't know what that means if he missed practice maybe some type of illness or something but like i said guys who have concussions at least get on the stationary bike and then you have curtis samuel william jackson and all these other guys working on the side field with the trainers and things like that so i don't know why sadiq charles just completely wasn't at practice at all 
especially after leading our team in preseason snaps. Through the first two weeks, Sadiq Charles has played more snaps than any player out of our entire team. Now on to the quarterbacks. Nothing very noteworthy other than the fact that Ryan Fitzpatrick threw a super dime over the shoulder to Terry McLaurin, who was in double coverage by Torrey McTire and Cameron Curl. And the coverage was great. It was just a better throw and a better catch. Like I always say, a great quarterback and a great receiver are always going to beat a great DB or even two of them. That's just how the NFL rules are designed. It's literally set up for DBs to fail. So when a quarterback and a receiver are super on point, super chemistry, the quarterback throws a great ball, the receiver is able to make a great catch, and there's literally no coverage in existence that can stop it. I mean, it was a 50-yard pass for a touchdown, and Fitzpatrick threw it in a way that McLaurin was able to catch it in stride. He didn't even have to slow down for it. So we need more of that from Ryan Fitzpatrick. I need to see a lot of that in this preseason game coming up against the Ravens, and we need to see a lot of that throughout this season period because we have a tough schedule ahead offensive line nothing very noteworthy but tight end wise when discussing Samus Reyes Rivera said that the tight ends are developing very well and Samus Reyes specifically has a great skill set and with some quality coaching they believe he can develop into something really nice. So that sounds like a guy that even if he doesn't make the 53-man roster, they're going to figure something out to where no other team can touch him. I believe we get two players that are untouchable on the practice squad. So if he doesn't make the 53-man roster, he's definitely one of those. Because like we saw even before we got him, before we even signed him, other teams were trying to get them so we know for a fact that if we dangle them out there and allow anybody else to get them they'll scoop them up quickly and they'll probably sacrifice a 53 man roster spot even if he's not ready to play just to bank on his development i mean we've already seen the progress he's made from not knowing what a 3-4 defense was just a few months ago to what he did in that preseason game against the patriots so i want to believe in his potential i say give him a roster spot no matter what because we don't want to see him randomly go to a team like the eagles and then two years down the line looks like an all pro tight end one of the top three tight ends in the nfl he has that type of potential and we do not want to see that happen please no the eagles were one of the teams that were interested in signing him i believe the giants were as well so we gotta be careful also rivera said that ricky seals jones has done very well and has caught their attention so far in training camp and practices and preseason and things like that so that's really interesting to keep track of maybe they keep four tight ends so that samus reyes can make it it does sound like ricky seals jones is quite likely to make it at least over a tamari Hemingway. It definitely sounds like Samus Reyes and Ricky Seals Jones are above to Mary Kimingway and any other tight end on this roster on the depth chart. Nothing very interesting from the running backs and nothing really interesting from the wide receivers as well. Just other than the fact that Terry McLaurin, again, like I said earlier, beat Torrey McTire and Kermit Curl with great coverage down the field for a 50 yard touchdown. Caught it in stride, great throw from Ryan Fitzpatrick, but great concentration to catch it over his shoulder. And then McLaurin was also super excited about it and yelling up and down the field about his touchdown and things like that. And of course, he loved Ryan Fitzpatrick's pass right there. That's what we need more from him. And like I've been saying in my videos, I'm only talking about the important and notable thing because guys like Chase Young, Montez Sweat, Deron Payne, Jonathan Allen, and even like Benjamin St. Juice is now in that company. Terry McLaurin, Cameron Curl, when they make plays and practice, you kind of expect it. Landon Collins is a little different because we're seeing him recover from an injury. And then, of course, the rookie class, the majority of them, when they're making great plays and when they're having a great day, we have to talk about it. But guys like Samuel Cosby and Benjamin St. Juice, when they make plays, when they're having a good day at practice, it's kind of just the usual now. We expect that out of them. So I'm only reporting the very interesting things from guys that you don't expect. But then moving on to the defense, starting with the defensive line, there's also important quotes that I want to talk about. Like Landon Collins said that Sweat and Young's growth is all centered around knowledge. He said, quote, knowledge is key. They're understanding of what their jobs are and playing with no hesitation. And that's a good point. When you're able to do more and think less, you perform better. So now that they're developing, Montez Sweat going into his third year, Chase Young going into his second, it shows. And Del Rio even spoke about Montez Sweat specifically. He said that he's developed more tools in the toolbox as a pass rusher last season and says that you, quote, should expect to see a jump because of his understanding of the position, unquote. And then the linebackers, just to let you know, since we're in the linebacker section, when they run that 5-2-4 defense and it's only two linebackers out there, it's five defensive linemen. Sometimes it's Jamin Davis and Cole Holcomb. Sometimes it's Cole Holcomb and John Bostic. So right now, Jamin Davis and John Bostic are interchangeable. Cole Holcomb is the only constant. Also, Jack DeRio spoke on Jamin Davis and his presser as well. He said, quote, he's getting better and better with every rep, pleased with the way he's come in. 
unquote. He said generally about this entire rookie class, especially on the defensive side, Benjamin St. Juice, Jamin Davis, he said he feels the same way about them as he felt about Chase Young last year with their professional approaches to the game. He also said, as far as Jamin Davis, quote, he'll get more and more comfortable. He's got some amazing traits that we covet, unquote. So that just shows that they believe in Jamin Davis. They believe in his potential. They're banking on that. And they're also seeing a lot of progress. Like I said in my previous video, when I discussed days 17 and 18 of training camp, Jamin Davis, he had a low 30 something grade in that Patriots game, his rookie debut in preseason. And then he had like a high 70 something grade from Pro Football Focus in the Bengals game. And like I said, even watching the game, I can notice a, a big difference. He still may not be ready to start at Mike Linebacker. Of course, he's not Luke Keekly yet, but there was a very noticeable difference from how he played against the Patriots to how he played against the Bengals. It seemed like he was just mentally ahead. He was able to process things much quicker. He was playing a little bit more instinctual. We still need a lot more progress from him, but it's very encouraging to see any progress from him at all. He definitely looks like a better linebacker going from that Patriots game to that Bengals game, and we need to bet on that. Then the DBs. Jack Dario described Torrey McTire as a, quote, pleasant surprise, unquote, in camp. He cited him as one of the players that they've added this year to bolster the secondary. They love him. And Jack Darrell even said that they moved him around a bit and were eager to see how he would play with pads on, and they love what he's done. He's checked all of the boxes, he stepped up to every challenge they've given him, and they love Tory McTire. Jack Durrell has also spoken about Trey Apke. He said, quote, he's been very good and steadily getting better, unquote. And that is true. I mean, again, I'm not saying Trey Apke is NFL regular season game day ready to play some corner, but with him already being a strong special teams contributor, which is quite likely why he'll make this team anyway, it's encouraging to hear that he's not the worst corner of all time like he was the worst safety of all time. He's actually a pretty decent corner, at least depth wise, especially since he's like fifth string out of outside corners. If you're talking about William Jackson, Kendall Fuller, Benjamin St. Juice, and then Torrey McTire, Trey Ackie's probably fifth, maybe sixth behind Danny Johnson, who knows? But at least he's not completely awful and unplayable. Ron Rivera also spoke about Torrey McTire as well. He said he's done a nice job. He really has. He's a guy that as we go into this final week, we're very interested in. So they're going to have a strong eye on him. And that sounds like he'll get a lot of playing time in his next preseason game, whether the starters play or not. And then Del Rio also spoke about Cameron Curl. He said, quote, Cam has shown his worth as a super intelligent guy that can find his way around the secondary. He can play slot in the nickel role. He can play free. He can play strong. He can play in the box and even play on the edge, unquote. And that's huge praise from your defensive coordinator. The fact that they feel like Cameron Curl can literally play everywhere in the secondary, like I've been saying, that's big news for him. And it sounds like he's going to be out there no matter what. Even if Landon Collins is technically the starting strong safety on the depth chart and maybe snap one against the Chargers, Cameron Curl's still going to be on the field somewhere doing something. And then special teams. The only notable thing is that Dustin Hopkins went four for six in a Washington kicking period earlier today. The first kick from 40 yards, he hit the right up right, which was a miss. He hit good on 35, good on 40, good on 33. Then he hit the right up right again on a 43 yard kick. But you have to note that there was a bad snap on that one. And then he made a 45 yarder, which, you know, doesn't sound really good because he was 50% on kicks between 40 to 45 yards. And I don't think that's too spectacular. Granted, one of them was a bad snap, but still like that's not that's unacceptable. You need to be able to go six for six on all of those kicks. I don't care. That's unacceptable. Those are the expectations. Now moving on to some notable Rivera quotes. He spoke about occasionally using five defensive linemen. He said that it's mostly a situational thing, but he did acknowledge that it does put pressure on offenses, and that is very true. Nikki Javala looked into it, and she found out that according to Football Outsiders, Washington played the most snaps with five defensive linemen 58 last season, and his defense allowed the fewest yards per play and had the lowest DVOA when rushing five or more. So basically, when we had five defensive linemen as a formation, when we ran a 5-2-4, we were literally the best defense in the NFL. Statistically, according to Football Outsiders, when you look at all of the advanced statistics, DVOA, yards allowed per play, when we run five defensive linemen, we're the best defense in the NFL. 
And it's only going to be better now that we added William Jackson. Landon Collins is finally looking like his all-pro self from the Giants. We have athletic linebackers. Cole Holcomb got better. Jamin Davis is learning. So our 5-2-4 alignment should be even better this year than last year. And again, last year, when we ran five defensive linemen, to reiterate, we were the best defense in the NFL. So I'm expecting them to do that more often this year. We didn't really start super duper doing it until the Bucks game, where we actually ran it quite a bit. We used it sparingly throughout the rest of the season before that Bucks playoffs game. But in that Bucks playoff game, we actually used it quite a bit and it produced pretty good results. I mean, whatever we can do to put Chase Young, Jonathan Allen, Matt Ioannidis, Deron Payne, and Montez Sweat on the field at the same time is great in the first place. But then also when you have all of those guys out there at the same time, that's just more potential one-on-one -on -one matchups for all of those guys. And that just spells disaster for any offense and any offensive line in the NFL. Ron Rivera also spoke about positional flexibility again. He's been speaking about it day after day since he's been our head coach and especially this offseason. But he said that it's been an emphasis for him. He thinks that there might be even more positional flex than last year, which is a positive for when the team prepares for game day. And that's so true. When you have guys that can play multiple positions, first of all, what he didn't mention today, but he said it before, that when there's an injury, you have so many different guys that can step up. If there's an injury to guard, you have guys that can play both guard positions and tackle within like the same person. It's not like you have to take up 12 offensive linemen spots on your 53-man roster because you have guys that can play up and down anywhere on the offensive line or at least on both sides of the offensive line at one position. And then even on top of that, when it comes to strategizing, especially on the defensive side of the ball, especially like secondary-wise and things like that, when you have guys that can play anywhere, outside corner, slot corner, strong safety, free safety, whatever, you get to mix up your coverages and confuse offenses because they'll never know, okay, so Cameron Curl is on the field. We know he's going to be doing this you can't do that because you never know what Cameron Curl is going to be doing you never know what Kendall Fuller is going to be doing you may not even know exactly what William Jackson or Benjamin St. Juice will be doing because they're also fairly versatile as well and that's going to create a lot of turnovers especially behind a defensive line this disruptive Rivera also said that he and Jack Del Rio's chemistry have developed very well over the past two years said that nowadays they think the exact same way in terms of philosophy and style so that's great to hear i mean having a regular offseason last year would have helped a lot with that instead of us having to do it on the fly in regular season games that matter in the win and loss column but now after that season and now that we finally had a normal offseason training camp and all of that they've been able to get their chemistry down packed even more and then speaking of del rio he had a quote on Landon Collins. He said, Landon's done everything we've asked of him. He's moving around as well as I've seen him. He's had a great training camp. And that just echoes what a lot of reporters have been saying that basically Landon Collins, and we've even seen it some in the preseason, that he literally looks the best he's ever looked by far since he's ever been wearing the burgundy and gold. This is the closest he's ever looked to his Giants All-Pro self, and I'm excited. There's a reason why Cameron Curl isn't like the automatic starter at strong safety, because Landon Collins actually looks good enough to force us to move Cameron Curl somewhere else on the field, because we're just better off having both of them on the field any given play. Moving on to some random quotes, speaking of Landon Collins, he said that the roster turnover with Ron Rivera's arrival was, quote, much needed, unquote. He said some of the moves were quote a tough pill to swallow unquote but it was definitely necessary overall he said when he arrived in 2019 he could sent a lot of change was needed and he was super happy when Ron Rivera got here in 2020 to turn it all around and if you think about it man it's crazy because ever since Ron Rivera's been here all of the quarterbacks are new every single one of them every running back new potentially four of the six or five of the seven wide receivers all of the tight ends and then depending on how many offensive linemen you keep maybe seven of the nine or eight of the ten or eight of the ten are all new I mean that is a complete roster haul especially in the offensive side of the ball the defense is overhauled as well but a lot of it but a lot of the players are still kind of here but on the offensive side I mean, literally, maybe two receivers and maybe two offensive linemen will be the only guys that were here before Rivera got here. That is crazy. And they definitely look better. They look deeper. They look more competitive. Wide receiver is going from one of our biggest weaknesses to potentially one of our biggest strengths, maybe only behind defensive line. And that's by default because the defensive line should be the best in the NFL. So unless we have the best receiving core in the NFL, 
which it doesn't exactly look like we will, that's a little too glass half full even for me. By default, that can only be second in our position group rankings. And that may be a video I do, our position group rankings heading into week one. And then lastly, as far as quotes go, Chase Young smiled when asked about the Ravens being on a 19 game win streak in the preseason. He was asked if they're thinking about it and Young smiled and said, quote, yeah, we've heard about it, unquote. So they're aware that the Ravens have won 19 straight games in the preseason and even though the game technically doesn't matter because it's preseason they do care and they're gonna go out there and do what they can to try to end that streak hopefully if the starters just play one half maybe they dominate enough on defense and offense to have a big enough lead to where even when the backups come out they can just go ahead and anchor it down and we can go ahead and get that last preseason dub and end that streak and then in very random news Washington tackle Charles Leno our starting left tackle has donated a lot of supplies to aid the Afghan refugees refugees something very random but i wanted to make sure people were aware of that he's always been one of the biggest staples in the chicago community and i'm pretty sure even if chicago didn't miss his on the field contribution after they released him i'm pretty sure they missed his off the field contribution because he was always known as one of the biggest philanthropists out of the entire chicago bears organization and he's bringing that right over here to dc so that's good to hear that he's keeping that going and then lastly man these nfc East struggles man it's every week bruh starting with the worst situation of them all the cowboys first of all the dak prescott situation who knows if he's even going to be ready to play week one and then even if he is is he ever going to be the version of himself before that severe injury we'll see because the injury was a leg injury but he's dealing with a shoulder injury right now so i don't know what he's got going on nobody really knows what he has going on not even necessarily the cowboys but then also the cowboys have a really bad covid 19 situation going on they have safety demonte kazee an offensive lineman connor williams all being added to the covid 19 list after testing positive very recently and they are joining already on the covid 19 list wide receiver cd lamb safety malik hooker defensive tackle carlos watkins and safety israel mukamu and then defensive coordinator dan quinn is also in quarantine I mean, they are in shambles right now. Now, if I'm a Cowboys fan, the only reason I'm not very worried is because you're not going to beat the Bucks week one anyway. But like, you better hope everything is right by week two, because as of right now, it's looking really ugly for y'all. And then the Giants or Dory Jackson, he went down in practice today. Kenny Galladay's already been dealing with injuries. He was injury prone for the Lions. Dory Jackson has been injury prone for the tight ends when the Giants just signed him. And he's already dealing with injuries for the Giants as well. They're saying that he should be ready to go by week one. But again, even like we were saying back in March when they were signing all of these injury prone, but star level free agents, the Giants are building a great roster. But are these guys even going to be available? And so far, their biggest free agent signings between Adoree Jackson and Kenny Galladay, both of them have been hurt a lot this offseason. And they're going into this regular season already very banged up. Not surprised, not wishing injuries on anybody. But this was just something that we were trying to warn Giants fans, like, be aware of this. These guys are injury prone. I'm not too sure if they're just going to come to the Giants organization and suddenly just become healthy guys. And as of right now, they're off on the wrong foot. And then lastly, the Eagles. Boy, their joint practice against the Jets. Their starting offensive lineman, Andre Dillard, is getting beat bad against a journeyman jeremiah Velaga in one-on-one -on -one drills like come on bro i mean he literally got pancaked and this is the second day in a row that he's been beat badly by that guy again this is a journeyman defensive lineman that's just depth for the jets and he's beating up on the starting eagles offensive line so man again with our defensive line being our strength of our team the eagles look like they're gonna be outside we already know the giants o-line is not very good on paper the giants have the worst o-line in the division and then the cowboys whoo with all their injury concerns and even connor williams already on the covid 19 list whoo man our defensive line is about to eat up six games a year at minimum and then lastly as far as the nfc east nfl.com analyst jeffrey chadiha ranked all eight nfl divisions of course number one is is nfc west number two is nfc north number three is afc east number four is nfc south number five is afc west i pretty much agree with those the number six nfc north number seven afc south and then of course last eighth the nfc least and that makes a lot of sense again i agree maybe i will switch up some of these orders but generally the nfc west 
in the AFC North as your top two divisions. Maybe AFC East third. I may agree with that as well. And then the NFC least is eighth and the AFC South is seventh. I, I agree. I think we will, by the end of the season, have more respect in this and move up to sixth, maybe ahead of the NFC North and especially the AFC South. But as of right now, based on what we did last year, we definitely deserve to be eighth. But again, I think we'll rise up to maybe like sixth after this season coming up, but we'll see. Because you have Justin Fields over there in the NFC North, and he may light it up for the Bears, who aren't even the best team in the division. It's assumed to be the Packers. And people think even the Minnesota Vikings are supposed to be some type of tough this year. But who knows? But yeah, man, that's the end of this video. Please get in the comment section and let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video. Please like this video if you liked it, if you learned anything. Of course, subscribe if you haven't. Again, get in the comment section. Let me know how you feel about everything discussed, especially the NFC East situation, the 5-2-4 defense situation, and all of the notable quotes I gave y'all in this video. And as always, man, I appreciate all of the support, man. Big shouts out to everybody that donates to the channel. A special shouts out to all of my sponsors, especially my Pro Bowl sponsors, who name you see scrolling on the screen right now. I really appreciate all y'all, man. I'll catch y'all later. I'm out.